it was 2005, and Walter, one of the owners, uh, part of the family that owns the Ames Envelope Company, took me on this meandering tour through all the interconnected buildings that make up the facility. My jaw dropped in front of these giant rolls of paper that would become hundreds of thousands of envelopes. And we shouted over the clanging machines as we passed among the lanes of ladies who were overseeing the cutting and folding of a seemingly endless stream of manila filing folders. Ames was the biggest employer in the city, but in our new digital world, people weren't cranking through the reams of paper like they used to. Walter wanted to brainstorm reuse of a crazy big space like this. A couple years ago, the last of the Ames operations moved south, and the place went silent. But over the last couple years, piece by piece, this space is refilled with pretty much the kind of crazy cool things that Walter and I talked about that day. First, it was a silkscreen company, an engineering firm, a guitar builder. Then the Artisans Asylum with their shared shops and 140 studios. Greentown Labs with their innovative entrepreneurs. We even have quirky stuff like aircraft aerial arts where you can develop your circus skills. And we've got this kind of magnificence, Brooklyn Boulders, a new kind of jaw-dropping scale. It's incredibly amazing that today, more people come here to pick up a paycheck than during the best years of Ames Envelope. Unfortunately, industrial spaces like this are endangered in America's downtowns. In communities where we're longing for a more pedestrian-oriented environment and where there's a great desire for more housing, it's hard to make a case for factories and old garages. But I say if we're to keep the souls of our cities, we need to keep our cities gritty. Now here in Somerville, we're looking back to the glory days of the city, to the early 1900s, when the trolley cars stopped over 100 times each day, filled with commuters and shoppers. Like other communities around the country, we're aspiring to a, a neighborhood where you can live, work, and play, all without getting into a car. There's all kinds of goodness from this, whether it's environmental sustainability or economic vitality. But what would this photographer have seen if the camera was faced in the other direction? I'd love to show you, but while I've seen lots of vintage photographs of Union Square, I've seen absolutely none pointing to the southeast. On that side of the square was the home of the Union Glass Factory, which eventually became Corn and Glass. It was the slaughterhouses, the brickyards, the barrel maker. But those businesses fueled the whole economic development of the city. Grittiness wasn't a symbol of a neighborhood in decline. It was the messiness of industry. So what happened to all those old businesses? Across the country, life in the grassy suburbs and behind the wheel of a car became the American aspiration. Cities got poorer and tougher. Urban life became associated with danger and filth. But here we are today, and everybody's in love with cities again. Let me tell you the story about one of those manufacturing spaces and what's happening there now. Built in 1885, this building used to manufacture window frames and sashes and then moved into making museum exhibit cabinets. The raw materials came in on the lower level, and then as work progressed, the, it moved story by story to the finished product. Over the years, there's been numerous other businesses in that uh, space, but most notably several generations of bicycle builders, including Merlin, Independent, and Fat City. Today, Metro Pedal Power operates on the lower level. They're a bicycle power delivery service, you might know. Wednesday keeps a small urban farm on the side. Upstairs is Fringe Union, which is an assortment of different businesses that share a common space, including a letterpress printer, a floral web and product engineers, a video producer, a green roof company. Now, this is not quality class A space, but it doesn't need to be fancy. What matters most is that it's affordable. Affordable to entrepreneurs who need more than a laptop and a seat in a coffee shop to grow their business. But in communities like this, where it's only a 15-minute walk to Harvard University, when it's just one minute to a sweet downtown with bars and shops and restaurants, when there's a new transit station rumbling in in the future just a block away, it's the location that holds the value more than the building itself. In communities like this, there's intense market pressures for new housing. Even a modest condo around here will fetch a half a million dollars. Why should property owners put up with a relative pittance from these startup businesses when there's money like that to be made? And for the most part, nobody's going to care about that old factory or that dilapidated garage. All across the country, we're seeing this happen, as our magnificent old mill buildings will never rumble again with opportunity, because behind those windows, there's open concept living rooms.
It can be particularly attractive to build new affordable housing in these spaces because in communities like ours, with displacement is a real concern, it provides a chance to enable all of our community a place to stay. But for me, there's two sides of that uh, economic affordability question. On one side, we do need more housing, but on the other side, we need jobs at a range of skill levels that provide good wages. Greediness equals opportunity. If you're working in an unskilled job, you're in a restaurant kitchen or behind a cash register with little chances for advancement. On the gritty side of Union Square, you're making twice the annual wages. In Massachusetts, 60% of the people in manufacturing don't have a bachelor's degree. Grittiness equals opportunity for all kinds of creative endeavors and entrepreneurs. It's where connections are made, ideas bubble. There's some urgency to this love of grittiness. It's like a public park or an open space. If that woodland becomes housing, it's near impossible for it to ever return to open space. And it's a similar way for these commercial properties. You might see industrial spaces converted to housing, but you're not gonna see housing move back to industrial. The fact is, a quarter of the new growth, the national growth since 2009 is in manufacturing. And while it's not like the heyday of the early 20th century, 10% of all employment in Massachusetts is in manufacturing. Now there's certain aspects of uh, manufacturing of yore that we really don't want to replicate. But today's environmental regulations and technology means we're no longer looking at those old smokestack industries. What we do want to replicate is that modesty of scale. We're talking about what's appropriate here, which is typically one or two buildings tucked in right among the places to live. The urban activist Jane Jacobs from the 1960s said, new ideas need old buildings. Every house needs that scrappy space where you can fix stuff, store your tools, and keep that thing you know you're going to need someday. Every theater needs a backstage where the sets and the costumes are stored before the magic of the show. And cities need their greedy spaces too. And that's the challenge for our generation. How can we look at something humble, unassuming, maybe even decidedly unattractive, and not seek to transform it, but to put it back to work? Thank you.